So um, somebody had uh, had the problem that uh, on on Windows uh, the environment, the Python environments of uh, between QGIS and the system are completely separate. Which means if you if uh, you install the IPython console um, and IPython is not available within um, QGIS. It doesn't help if you install it on the system because it's a different place. Um, there is a way, but we didn't quite figure out. It did not work yet, but that's definitely the way to go. And I've done that before. Uh, you can within uh, the QGIS console, you can import pip, and then you use this command pip dot main um, to run pip within QGIS and uh, this way install a new package. So I'll maybe try to demonstrate that here if I have this the normal Python console and import pip into here. Pip not pip. Oh okay. I don't have pip installed here in this QGIS environment. So I can't demonstrate. Uh, but that's we we got further on the on the Windows installation. We had a different error. Um, let's maybe proceed with that script. And uh, this is now in in temp.py. But um, we had a suggestion of opening directly the the file which is in in the QGIS directory. And um, like here, if we edit it and click save as, then we know where it actually is. And it's in the user directory dot local share QGIS QGIS3 profiles default processing scripts. So we're going to search for that path now from Jupyter so we can open it over there. And that was in. Um, yeah, uh, if you in this gn uh, GNOME want to go into uh, a hidden directory, you can either press Control H to show them here, and another time uh, to show the hidden files. Uh, directories starting with a dot are hidden, um, or you can uh, use Control L to go to this location bar and type it in here. So I can now here go into local. And then, what was it? Share, QGIS, QGIS3, profiles default. Hey, that was too far. Um, processing scripts, and there is our script. That was quite far. But maybe it saves us a few copy and paste actions. Um, Yeah, then we have all all our variables uh, defined. Um, what we want to do first is uh, add our new column to to the output uh, to the vector layer, uh, and then fill it with our default value. And um, we're going to use a tool here from this processing toolbox. Um, we're going to use this field calculator tool. Um, it looks pretty much like the field calculator in, in a normal GIS, and it can, but you can configure it to have input values from different places. Um, oh yeah, and now I realize I actually made a made a mistake because this before, and um, what we want here as a as a presence value is actually not a number, but we want to have an expression, a field a calculator expression. So we have the right input user interface. You can still put just the one in there. It's no worries. Um, but otherwise, uh, maybe our field calculator doesn't like it. Um, and since, like, <laughs> since we don't know how that field calculator is actually called in in the Python code, and since this documentation is not yet available, um, I'm using again uh, this um, search script here to search for 
let's say calculator and then it gives me these three tools which which do have the calculator in their name um, and actually only this QGIS colon field calculator is, is really matching my search so I can now use this um, processing dot algorithm help to find out more about this tool QGIS colon field calculator And then tells me no, that this tool is called field calculator and does this and that uh, and it takes the following inputs uh, it's input field name field type field length field precision uh, whether it and then a boolean like yes or no true or false value uh, whether it, it should create a new field and then this formula which is supposed to be the um, the, the new value and and an output or name or destination so and now there's something which we haven't done yet uh, to run such an algorithm um, we use processing.run <laughs> surprise surprise um, and the first parameter is the name of the or this ID of the tool uh, which as we just looked up was QGIS uh, colon field calculator and uh, the second um, parameter is a, no, is a dictionary of all the input values so um, no, that's not very orderly. And no. Um, have you worked with dictionaries before? Uh, like a dictionary is, is uh, like an array with a named index. So um, I and the indices here the keys are the names of the parameters and the values are the, are the values of the input parameters so if you if I want to specify here uh, this input value which I know from over here uh, we need and it should be a feature source but that can be just a, a vector layer um, then I copy this exact name input in uppercase letters um, into a string like with quotes uh, and then a colon and behind that we, we put the value we want to uh, assign it and uh, here we we take our input vector layer which we called species polygons but then our tool needs uh, still other um, parameters and it's field name field type field length field precision it needs a lot actually and I may be typing as many as I can from my memory to over here oh no let's do it one by one um, and the field name uh, would then be uh, yeah, the presence, like the new column name, presence column name, the field type, and the field type, how do we decide that now? Um, here there's uh, this index in, in this help of, of uh, different values which mean uh, like an enumerated value. Um, this is a drop-down menu then in the in the in the toolbox, um, and uh, we want to. It would be, but we don't we don't use that in the toolbox, um, and we want to create an integer uh, raster. So we put number one in into that parameter. Then we had field length. That's just like when you create a new field in raster calculator. So Let's make it five, then we can go until 10,000. That's more than enough. 
and the field precision for an integer like post uh, decimal mark uh, digits is obviously zero and we want to create a new field uh, remember in python the true and false are uppercase the first letter um, our formula is this new value here for the presence column Exactly, exactly. They are not defined, but they are being defined before the script is run. And that's a bit of processing toolbox magic here, which might be confusing at times, but yeah. And then we still need an output, uh, like a, a name output also for it as, a, as an input parameter. And um, since we don't want to really save that file, we can put it into a memory file, like in memory file, which is uh, called memory colon and then some name, which doesn't have to mean anything, but let's call that, I don't know, temp one. No. Oh no, I already had that here. Yeah. So that's the whole algorithm here, uh, except that there's something missing. Who, who guesses what? No? Oh yeah, actually there's a comma missing too, thanks. <laughs> but I didn't mean that. <laughs> there's something else still missing. Do I have all the commas in the other places? Yeah. <laughs> Um, we we get a return value. We get an output from this uh, from this algorithm, which is uh, a file, and uh, or which is actually a dictionary of of all the outputs. So we we put a dictionary in, and we get a dictionary out. Um, so we can capture our algorithm output, which is the return value of this processing dot run function in another variable. And that's now PD because um, we don't have any way of debugging that yet uh, because uh, there's no IDE at the moment. Uh, so we can just try whether it runs, but we can't control right now whether it, it works too. But we can still try whether there's any error in it. What was it? Uh, species. Rasterized species. Hey, there's something. Oh, yeah, there's something else then still to change. And if we now run that with kind of the standard parameters, but just change the species column name to be really the species, then, well, yeah, at least the field calculator is working. So apparently we did right. And I just noticed that apparently. Um, there's another magic thing here uh, that is in the name and in the group of the of this metadata item you don't need to replace the, un the spaces with underscores <laughs> yeah. and yeah what we what we have here now is like um, you have this algorithm output and this algorithm output is again a dictionary and it contains all uh, output variables um, and we have only we actually this algorithm only has one output which is called output um, and this is a vector layer an output vector layer um, and we want to work on with that and uh, that is now let's define a new variable which is called species polygons and then now I'm going to a more sane uh, variable naming scheme because that underscore thing is it's getting long otherwise. Species polygons with the presence variable. Uh, that would be then 
um, within the algorithm output the uh, value of with the key output so yep so that's now a new layer maybe I should add some comments here too Exactly, and that it returns a dictionary because uh, there is algorithms which return more than one object. So it might be that it returns a raster layer and a vector layer and three numbers. And yeah. then, um, as a next step. Um, if you want to run this algorithm uh, for every for every species we have, we have to get a list of of species. That's the next page. Yeah. Um, No. Um, we we uh, have to find all unique values in for for the species. Um, so what we do is we have here now this this layer, uh, which is called species polygon presence, and it's a full grown uh, vector layer. So we can, and it's. A bit of cheating here again, um, or a bit of uh, showing the real uh, potential of, of this scripting, um, like apart from, from using just these predefined uh, algorithms, um, there is something called uh, a PyGIS cookbook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, here it works. Um, which, uh, in a way, um, in in quite a well, quite a nice manner, uh, brings you towards how to program with uh, Python within QGIS. Yes. Um, and there's uh, one one chapter which is called using vector layers. Um, and here. That's not using the processing tools, but the actual Py, uh, the actual QGIS objects. So also, our layer, which we have now as an output thing, is actually a QGIS object. It's not a, it's not a process, it's not a shape file, it's not a processing thing. It's a QGIS Python object, and um, this uh, Python cookbook now shows you what you can do with these layers and. Um, for example, you can get features, and then you, you get all the features, or you can set that, set that the selected features are nothing. Or here, that's that's actually a better example. You can see um, for feature in layer dot get features do something with it. You can access the geometry. You can um, access its type. You can uh, change things. You can change its fields. You can print its its uh, its fields, its attributes, um, and what we are searching for here now is probably not in here. You can add new features, delete features, but that's all, all not what I want. Okay, but anyway, like that's that's a good place to start if you if you want to. Uh, access any any more advanced topics here um, but I know that it's documented here in the API documentation which we had open before and again in classes we can search for the vector vector layer no and then there's 60 times vector layer surprise surprise And what we search for is that normal 
QGIS vector layer. That's the object we get. And that's now super technical here. Uh, but you can find everything like the, the different function. No? There's so much in here. The different functions you can you can use on this on this object or the different function this object has. Um, for example, here and I looked that up at home. So I, I only show you quickly. There's this fields um, which returns the columns this vector layer has. And and within these fields we can find we can get the unique values. So. Um, we're now gonna get the fields of these values into a variable. Um, and then find uh, the unique values. And for the unique values, uh, there's, a, there's a function uh, which is just called fields dot uh, unique values, or no, which is actually called uh, layer dot unique values. Um, but what happens is that it doesn't take the field name, but the field index, uh, which makes another step necessary, which sometimes is like that. So we have to find the field index, which we can f for our field, which we can find from fields dot, um, yeah, not surprising name index from name. And um, the field for the species we also have as, as an input name here, as a column name, uh, species column name as, an, as a parameter. So it's in this uh, magically field variable. And then we have the index of this particular field. Like the index is just zero, like it starts counting at zero. It's not nothing nothing super advanced and to get now the unique species out of it we use this other command which is a function of the of the vector layer again field index and then I have a list of unique species and Ah, yeah. And what am I doing here wrong? Undefined name. Oh, yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we can. Can you put that comment with flake to on the top that it ignores certain variables? Mm, I don't know. But yeah. Species polygons. There's the same mistake another time. Polygons presence. Yes. Um, and just to test whether that script works so far, even though it doesn't output anything yet, I'm gonna again run it from here. It only produces temporary files, but... Ooh. <laughs> 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 Let's hope that was was just a glitch here. Welcome to the real world. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the real world when you use uh, testing beta programs. <laughs> That's why there's no documentation yet, so nobody uses it yet. So we have still this rasterized species, species one here. And suspension. Yes, this time it works. <laughs> or at least so far. No, there is actually a, a mistake in here. And I made some mistake with these errors. Unfortunately, are a bit critical because they don't tell you the real line, but only an approximate line. Uh, approximately line 50. Or maybe it is in line 50 even. The QGIS vector layer object is not callable. Did I do that? Yes, I did. I forgot here the function name and just called the entire one. And that function was called unique values, obviously, because that's what we want. Good that I tested it because then I knew 
it's gonna be somewhere in the lines I just added. Yeah, it's successful. It leaves some bar up here, but yeah, never mind. And yeah, let's go on then. Um, now we, now that was already like the last few lines was already something which would have been quite complicated just in this model builder thing to get the unique values out. Uh, but now there's the thing which is uh, practically impossible in there in this graphical modeler, which is really easy here though. Uh, we can just make a, a loop and say for species in unique species do something. And this something is going to be um, select uh, only features which have that species and then rasterize that. And um, as a first step before those two, um, let's define an output name already for our file and um, that's where we need the os.path which I which I imported before to make to use uh, os path join to put the directory we got together with a file name um, but let's make two different file names um, Let's make them separately, it doesn't cost so much, uh, because we need, and that I only found out by trial and error, uh, we need actually a temporary uh, shape file, otherwise the last this rasterizing uh, tool does not work. It does not work with memory layers for some reason. Um, unfortunately, that's not documented, or not properly, but that's how it goes. Um, we want to join the directory name which we got as output directory from from our toolbox item and then maybe use the species as a file name uh, but replace within the species uh, string every space with an underscore because that's a parent tradition in here uh, and then still Yep. then still add a file extension so for shapefile.shp and let's do the same thing for the raster too exactly the same except for the extension file extension being tiff then so we have the file names and then we are again going to processing.run um, and maybe this time right away bring that algorithm output um, um, assignment in here. Uh, and this time the algorithm we want to run um, was uh, the select something by by attributes select features by attributes um, and there's again a tool here which we can use which is select by attribute and um, like as a toolbox it looks like that you you enter a layer you enter an attribute uh, you enter an operator and a value so it's going to compare this attribute to i don't know what was the stegosaurus no, but something like that um, but uh, again i don't know how it's how it's called in in python No, I don't think so. Maybe. It doesn't do anything. Oh, there. It's open it's in R. And then it says no internet connection is available. So, yeah. <laughs> Apparently you can't get it from here. <laughs> um, where you can get it from, maybe, wait a second, is from this 
Processing Toolbox Documentation. because there's this list of different processing providers and algorithms. And we now saw that, where are we? The select by attribute is from QGIS itself, so built-in algorithm. Um, and it's huh, within, ah, sorry, it was within vector selection so, oh, there's extract, oh no, extract by attribute. We wanted to have select by attribute. Um, but it, again, doesn't tell us the name of the, of the tool, actually. It only tells us the different parameters. Oh no, there it is. There we are. Except that it's the, the old syntax, which, where the run is still is called differently, but and where the arguments are not in the dictionary. So, um, but we know that it's called QGIS select by attribute. And I'm gonna uh, cut here, uh, like the uh, cut here a bit short and just tell you that, oh no, we actually looked that up already. I'm just gonna uh, copy the arguments from Uh, from my notes and that was that we use here now this um, the, the layer we created here as an input then as the field we use uh, our species column name input parameter, uh, then we have an operator and the operator is supposed to be the equal sign and that has the index zero in, in this uh, drop-down menu and uh, for the value we compare it to, we use the species for here, from here from the loop. Missa. I got that. Sorry, German keyboard has exactly the Y and the Z exchanged. So. And output, are, no, that's defined. Yeah, fine. Mm -hmm. And um, again, our um, how do you call that now? That's the What's the singular of species? Species. So I have to make a one species polygons, <laughs> polygons. <yeah. laughs> is our uh, return value here? Um, which we now uh, have to save into an intermediate shape file, as I told you. Um, which again is another processing.run algorithm. And this time we don't go through the whole length of searching for it because I have it in my notes here and I can say you, tell you that uh, the one we want to use here now is native and safe select, selected features. Um, and that goes that again has a few input parameters. And spider, why do you format it so? And that being input, and obviously our input is uh, the output of this processing of this processing algorithm. So it's the one species polygons. And it also needs an output name. Um, and that is our output sh shape file. And here there's another error nobody noticed. <laughs> Come on. Uh, 
element um, that gives us again the output name and let's call that yeah let's call that one species shape file because that's what it is um, output and then we're down to our very last um, algorithm which is the actual uh, rasterization of of this uh, shapefile now and what we use for that is rasterize Uh, rasterize vector to raster and now I'm sorry for the people on their own computer because that tool I was broken and I just repaired it last week uh, it's not yet in the installed QGIS things because I didn't contribute it yet because it's not yet nice enough I'm not proud enough on, of the code yet but um, on our virtual machines I already installed it and um, it has a lot of different input uh, variables, but we only need a few of them. Um, just to go through, we have input layer, as always, an attribute field, which is going to be burned into the layer. Uh, then uh, you can decide whether you want to specify the size of the layer by having an output size in pixels or by specifying a resolution in map units per pixel. Then there's these, these two um, like dimension fields in width and height or uh, horizontal resolution, vertical resolution. Um, and then there's a few optional things like no data value by default is, uh, is dependent on the raster type, um, which you keep in bytes because that's the smallest and, and doesn't take so much. And finally, there's an output field. And Again, we actually this time we don't need the algorithm output, but let's still uh, take it. Um, and this time we run this gdal dot uh, column rasterize. Yeah, almost. And. Why? Why or why? Yes. And it takes like all those variables I just talked about. Uh, input is our one species shape file. Uh, then the field is the presence. Was it column name? I think we called that input variable. Uh, then dimensions, it's again, it's this uh, drop down menu, which means uh, behind there is actually enumerated list of, uh, of values. And that one is value zero and that one is value one. Um, it's documented in this help, um, but um, like, yeah, I can just tell you that that's that zero. Um, then let's specify some dimensions. I take 2000 wide and 1000 high because, uh, the, like in WGS 84, it's, um, 360 degrees wide and 180 degrees high. So it, it should be one to two, the relation to have uh, square pixels in a way. Um, then we have a few, uh, yeah, this is not, oh no, this is not necessary actually. Um, the raster type, no, type, we said to leave at byte, which was zero in the, in the enumerate, value and finally we want to specify where to save it and we had here this output file raster raster file okay yeah 
and that's hopefully that's hopefully working now because that would be our entire algorithm uh, it takes quite a few lines because uh, it's, it takes quite a lot of space to always uh, specify all those input values um, but in the end it's only um, like I don't know 20 lines of codes in, 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 in total so if we maybe make a short recap what, what were we actually doing here? yes so, so yeah, yeah if do you want to recap no <laughs> So I'm, I'm going to just show you here again. Uh, there's this damselfish uh, raster set we had here. And I'm again going to format it in this different way. So you can see um, that we have a lot of different species in here. And maybe I can make here the oh no, feature blending mode multiply so you can see where there's more on top of each others and um, yeah there's these 20 different or 30 different species uh, which all have their distinct range maps that their areas where they live um, and we want to have that extracted into rasters but per species uh, for for further calculations later just as our specification does anybody actually uh, see any familiar places in this map? No? Jason? <laughs> you should. <laughs> no? Like, that's yeah, that's clearly South America here. And that's probably like uh, Arabian Gulf and East Coast of Africa. Yeah. Anyway, like that was our our specification that we export those rasters, and uh, that's now also represented in in our code in a way. So we have uh, those different input variables, and then what we do first is add another column, uh, which is which is to become the raster values that is now here one most of the time. Uh, we could specify that in our tool there. Um, but we could also just calculate something that could be in a different output. We could uh, sum up the number of species which are in the same place, for example, or something like that. Um, then next, we, we gather all uh, unique uh, species names in, in that column, all unique values in that one column, um, and then loop over that. And for each of those unique species, um, we define output file names. Um, then we select all uh, features which actually do have that value of that uh, species, save that to a shapefile, and finally uh, convert this shapefile into a raster and save it in this uh, output file name. And keep your fingers crossed, that should now hopefully work. So what was our name? Rasterize the species. Come on, yeah. And that's our toolbox already. And there was, like I choose this input layer. I choose the this uh, species, the column name, which contains the species names. Um, then I keep that at default, that the new column is called presence. I'm never going to see that because that's only in, in temporary files anyway. Um, and then I still select some output directory where I want to put it. And that was in documents, damsel, fish. And then I'm trying to run it. And it looks like it opens always really like this quickly, this executing rasterize algorithm. And it does that very often, which is a good sign in a way, because it seems to really do it for every single species. And then it crashes. But it looks like it finished <laughs> before it crashed.
Yeah, that's all of them. Or no, that's not all of them. So maybe you have to run it another time. That's disappointing. Shape file. And run from the toolbox this species rasterization tool. And again, choose to save it in documents. Damselfish. Does it by default overwrite this application? Yes, mm -hmm. it does by default overwrite. Or, yeah, I would assume so. There's another thing how to find out what your QGIS is actually doing. Uh, seems not to be very stable. No, uh, down here is is this uh, this speech bubble, uh, which is the log messages of of uh, everything which is going on. So we ha have here the info that QGIS is starting, yeah, uh -huh. and that it's ready. Um, then we have some Python warning from something, which it's only warning, so whatever. It just says like, uh, yeah, it's outdated, deprecated function in something. Um, then this, there's a, a log about the about the plugins which are loaded and finally there's a processing log window too which tells us that um, it could not open grass algorithms because there's no grass installed yeah sounds logical in a way but i hope it's going to tell us also about what our algorithm is doing wrong halfway through It actually tells quite a lot here in the log in the log window, but it still crashes in the end. Um, there's another thing which you can do to know what it's actually outputting. Run it from a terminal, and just going out of that Anaconda installation first. And hopefully that tells us something, because actually exactly the same script worked. I wonder what I did differently. Do we have some memory leak in there? There's this entire script with some variable names a bit different. But, but in general, it's the same. Uh, inside the, the page for the, for the course. So I, that definitely works. So I'm going to now create a second tool here and save it in the same directory. And does that have a different name? Yes, it does. Good. And I'm, yeah. Just gonna species to Rust uh, to save it there and see whether QGIS can run that. It's called a bit differently, no? No, no. Yeah. Okay. It's obviously not in the recently used ones. Oh, it's not here at all, so we have to refresh that. And 
and we don't have a layer yet. That's why also it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And if I run that now, it has a lot of warnings here on the on the console, but. Oh, now it's getting really hot. But why is this computer getting hot when that's the virtual machine working? <laughs> Sympathy. Kik is died on signal 11, which is segmentation fault. Um, so I'm pretty sure that's not connected to our code, but that's something else because it worked this morning uh, and I still tried it in the morning. Um, but, anyway, yeah. but anyway, like that's that's how it would work. And I still want to show you how these um, output uh, rasters now look like, exactly as you expect them to. They're um, like, no value, no data values where, where there's nothing, and then one where there, there is those species. That's exactly the presence value we put in there. Um, yeah, um, what, what I still want to note here is uh, that, of course, this processing this processing toolbox and, and its algorithms also put into a Python script, it increases the, the op uh, your options a bit and your possibilities of what to do with that. Uh, but, and that's the where, where it becomes really powerful, uh, you can equally in, in one of those processing scripts, you could also just uh, say import geo pandas and use uh, the power of geo pandas in there. You get your, your vector layer input parameter and you can open that in geo pandas. Um, or, and, and that's uh, another step more advanced, you can write your own plugin. Um, and it's not so much more advanced. Uh, for example, if you, if you want to just start, have, have some button here to do something for you, um, you can install this plugin builder uh, plugin, which I already did before in the, in the break. Um, and it allows you to create your own plugin. So if that would be the species rasterizer. And then that's And it would create, it would uh, even uh, already create me uh, different uh, like buttons and dialogues or widgets. And there, rasterize a species. And which uh, menu it goes into, so plugins, vector, and, and so on. And it would create all of that kind of by default ask me for a lot of things, then I'm saving it somewhere. And then there's this welcome note, which, which tells how to proceed. Uh, but the easiest first step is to open our Python file which we just, our plugin file in, oh, where are we here? Uh, species rasterizer.py, uh, for example, in spider and uh, all the, all the important code has been put into place and all you still need to do is fill, is that not a wrong, fill this run uh, function. So you can there, uh, do something useful here, it says here, so. That's also, I mean, it looks now really complicated what the plugin did for you, but uh, that's all you have to do. And Would you like to 
do now, basically, we would like to basically repeat the same thing, but as a plugin. So you ask for the input parameters here and so on, and then they you can. You can, and that's also installed even on the on the virtual machine. Um, one of the things this plugin builder also did, uh, it made this dialog for us, and that's here this .ui file, and it's also connected to this Qt designer, and uh, I can here now add my own input fields, for example, and say I want to have I don't know this no that's maybe weird, but it is a bit more complicated to to make these things nice than than in in the processing toolbox, but then it becomes much nicer. So. Yeah, and it's really yeah, it's it's quite like if you if you dive into it, you can quite quickly learn it. Like I. I just, I mean, I, I maintained a couple of like this really just for a working group uh, plugins for for a while and and learned it so well that nowadays I'm the maintainer of this cartogram plugin, which was not really complicated to, to start with. And it, what it does is uh, it can calculate those uh, distorted maps. And that's the kind of the input thing. Input dialog. Yeah, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to show you today. I'm a bit, I'm a bit feeling bad that this QGIS uh, processing script now crashed, but um, it should have worked. I promise, and it worked this morning. Um, it actually worked on the on the normal pod uh, instances, so it it might be connected to this uh, to the Pebbles yeah, installation somehow, or the way it's run. Maybe have a different supervisor, hypervisor, or something. Um, okay. Um, I'm I'm maybe gonna look into it and update that machine yeah. stuff. Uh, how do you like uh, your experiences in quantum GIS? So, uh, or using so, like, compared to the normal scripting, well, what we have done so far, mostly, like, using GeoPandas and, and these kind of different tools. So, like, what do you think, like, what would be the benefits of actually mm. diving into this quantum GIS compared to the normal scripting? Of these yeah. kind of situations would be... Yeah, I, it, it definitely de depends on the situation. And uh, someone, someone mentioned that in the break, uh, the one... The one situation where it's really good if you have some um, just end users, so to say, using your tool. So they can have just this button in QGIS and you can tell them press this and select that and click run and it works. Um, or it should work. <laughs> but um, whenever, whenever you're doing it yourself, um, there might be an advantage if you're anyway in a, in a GIS workflow, like in a desktop GIS, if you anyway have to have files open and uh, um, manage them there and then just ex export things, for example. Um, for that, it's definitely valuable. Um, if it's pure calculations, I think the tools you already talked about in this, in this uh, course are just a lot more powerful than what processing by default can do. And you can integrate those tools, those Python modules, into your scripts here. The added value, yeah, of just running it somewhere is maybe that you have your layers from the GIS directly accessible, but otherwise. What about the ecosystem? Because there are so many developers around quantum GIS, so yeah. there be some kind of benefits from Yes. That yes, uh, I wanted to mention that and forgot that. But uh, you have here also with the scripts and with the models, uh, which are included in 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 Python, uh, in QGIS. Uh, there's also this these uh, repositories where you can search for models somebody else uh, wrote. Okay, that's now not so many, but uh, for example, someone 
uh, wrote this inverse distance weighting model, which you can just download and, and, and start from there without kind of having to start at zero and just modify it to your needs. Um, or watershed analysis. It doesn't have a description because just somebody uploaded it and, and didn't care uh, because they, they themselves knew what it was. Uh, the same is true for scripts. You have to, you also have here um, this online script collection where there's also a lot of different scripts. No, there's, there's really a lot. And for example, I saw this morning there's there's a script which pretty much does what we just did. <laughs> yeah, that's, or I, I, I think it would because it's called create rasters from canvas field, a canvas something, feature layers, I guess. Um, and then points on crossing lines. Uh, well, I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, scripts here which might already do 90% of what you want to do, mm. which is definitely a good way to start. Yeah, yeah. Um, How would you get your, so what do you, if we would now want to publish this script mm -hmm. there, so what would we need to do actually? Honestly, I don't know, but I know where it's stored. Uh, so I hope that there's some uh, some <laughs> instructions there. There's in the QGIS GitHub uh, account, there's QGIS uh, dash processing uh, repository No. And that's where these extra scripts are stored, but it doesn't tell how to contribute to that actually. Yeah. But maybe it says somewhere. Like if it was a, I, I like I now have I have troubles answering this uh, question uh, concerning the processing scripts, mm -hmm. but. Um, uh, when it comes to plugins, there's this uh, official repository of QGIS, plugins.qgis.org, I think. Uh, uh, no, not Google Earth. I didn't want Google out to complete this. Yeah, plugins.qgis.org, where you can uh, submit your own plugin like by just, okay, you have to be logged in, and I don't know my password mm -hmm. um, by heart. But there's this list of different plugins, and you can just uh, so you upload your, your own. There. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And then people find it. And there's there's really there's really advanced things like, for example, this archaeological geophysics toolbox. It's probably really specific, and there's probably a lot of people who could use that. So, I mean, not a lot, but there's definitely people who might exactly use that. Or yeah. And there's, for QGIS 2, there's 800 plugins or 848 at this moment. And most of them are just in the course of being converted to QGIS 3. Do you have any idea how many plugins are already QGIS 2 based? A hundred or so. It's not yet so much. But that, that should come soon, hopefully. Um, the thing is, like, everything we did today works kind of in the same way in QGIS 2. It's just, um, I think it's more valuable to for you to already know how it's going to be in, in two months and not how it's how it's going to have been. <laughs> yeah, and usually it takes some time. It was the same when Python changed from 2 to 3, mm -hmm. so it, there was some time that the developers basically took and take the time to actually convert those. I mean, that's also, that's also the a typical thing with open source contributions that it might be that whoever wrote here this uh, quick WKT plugin in 2011 maybe is not even interested in it anymore. It might be that, mm. but then there might be someone else picking it up because they see like that's really valuable and doing it. Just something you can do. <laughs> something which I did uh, with this plugin I just showed you. Thank you so much for... Thank you for having me. Yeah, really nice. Nice to have you. Um, I guess at this time, uh, I still want to say a few words about the exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, should I turn off the recording? Uh, no, you can, you can leave it on.
Okay. So, so as we said in the beginning, uh, there is not really an exercise for for this week. Uh, but what I want you to do is that well, first of all. Uh, so this quantum GIS is installed on the cloud computer. So go out, uh, open the instance and try yourself running these things. So you get a bit of experience, uh, what it is to be creating scripts in, in quantum GIS. Maybe, maybe also try to, uh, that's, that's something which I had in mind, which would have been a good exercise. Um, try to convert the geo or try to just copy and paste the, the geo panel script from, from two weeks ago into a new processing script. Yeah, for example. Work there. I mean, it needs a bit of doing together, but no problem. Yeah, yeah, or something like that. So play around with the quantum GIS, but really there is nothing that you should return. Uh, but at the same time, so next week will be the, ne uh, the last lesson for the course uh, where we will do some network analysis uh, in, in Python. So this was kind of a jump from this Python that we have now used mostly into this uh, quantum GIS world uh, uses, using the processing module. Uh, so, but what I want you to do as well is that next week I will basically give out the, the final assignment work uh, and there will be some ta tasks that you will you can do but in addition if you have anything in mind that you would like to make as an own project so you can do that and and I recommend if you have any idea of, of like that would benefit your master's thesis or or whatever this kind of um, project that you you have going on so basically if you're interested just send me an email or uh, post me on slack that you would be interested in maybe doing that then what i would want from you is to kind of have a, some kind of proposal like what would be the project so that we can actually uh, take a look at it and, and see that if it's if, if it's like uh, okay for the final project so what the final project could be for example is some kind of tool of your own that you could use in your uh, in your thesis or in your work uh, in some other if, if you're working related to GIS or something like that or then some broader analysis where you would basically do some kind of data analysis and then write a short report of, of basically what what were the aims and and, and what were the results of, of this analysis so that's also possible but basically what I would like from you is to have these uh, few to for you to answer these to these few questions. So, uh, what is the aim of the project? What would be the final uh, the product from from that project? And what kind of data do you need? Is all the data available? Is there some kind of um, things that you are not certain yet if if the data is available or, or these kind of obs possible obstacles that you might have for, for uh, continuing the project and and did we actually uh, cover all those techniques and those things that you would be needing for actually doing that project so of course it's nice if if everything uh, if, if you have tried out everything that you would need for the project so that's beneficial so that you don't need to bang your head so much uh, when when doing the project but anyway so that's one possible uh, that you can do as a final project or final assignment in addition to the one that I will basically put out next week then uh, one other thing is this map challenge uh, we had this last year as well uh, so this is just a uh, fun a friendly competition basically so we were doing the visualizations last week and still continue this week as there is, is no uh, exercise so you can actually continue on those ones and return the maps on on friday but if you will if any one of you want to participate uh, so you can basically post and upload your 
great visualization that you have created to this uh, repository that I put out. So it's actually, oh yeah, well, I need to be logged in, but you, all of you should have access to that repository. So I have added you as a, as a member to that one. So no one else than the uh, participants of the course will see them uh, at this point, uh, but basically put your uh, visualization there and then we will basically make a poll and vote which one is is the nicest coolest map and then as a whoever will win so we have these nice uh, github web store uh, gift cards so that you will basically the winner will get this kind of nice t-shirt uh, that, that are available from the store. So we actually have something uh, as, a, as a prize and award as well. So that's something that you can consider as well. Uh